everybody. Welcome to the August 24th, 2020 Troy City Council meeting. I'll officially call this meeting to order. First on the agenda is the swearing in of our newest elected City Council member, Rebecca, Rebecca Chamberlain Crianga. So I will turn that over to City Clerk Dixon to handle the swearing in. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Chamberlain Crianga, if you would raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, the Charter of the City of Troy, and that I will faithfully perform the duties of the Office of City Council Member in and for the City of Troy, County of Oakland, State of Michigan, according to the best of my ability, so help me God. Yes, I do. All right, I'll sworn in. That was good, very good. Uh, with that in mind, well, I guess we can take a Congratulations. We normally have pictures or anybody that you want in the audience, but since we're doing things virtually, it's a little different tonight. But uh, we will, uh, we'll, we'll take some good pictures next time we can meet in person. How about that? So um, uh, that we'll call the meeting to order. I already did that. So the roll call, Ms. Dixon. Mayor Baker. Here. Councilmember Abraham. Here. Councilmember Brooks. Here. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga. Here. Councilmember Erickson Galt. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Here. Councilmember Hoderick. Here. All present this evening. Uh, there are no certificates of recognition or special presentations this evening. There are no carryover items and no public hearings. So we'll head straight into public comment. And uh, as a reminder, public comment is being handled during our virtual meetings by either leaving a voicemail at 248-524-3302 or by emailing public comment at troymi.gov. Uh, so for this evening's public comment, I will turn it over to City Clerk Dixon once again. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight we have two uh, email public comments and one voicemail. The first email public comment is from Jessica Brideau. Hello, I live on Avery Drive directly behind the new development along Long Lake between John R. and DeQuinder. This home construction project has been nothing but a nuisance for everyone living in this subdivision along Stoddard and Avery Drive. Not only were we never informed that the project was beginning despite the city and developer stating that we'd, reached, we'd, we'd received postcards informing us of the details, I've asked every neighbor along the street, not a single one of us got said postcard. But now the lack of respect for the residents living here is truly unbelievable. Why this construction site was turned into has turned into an industrial operation for topsoil is beyond me, and we were never informed of that. The amount of dirt and dust that gets into our yards and home on a daily basis all day long is absolutely disgusting. It is causing health problems for not only my family, but several of our neighbors. It has completely destroyed one of the neighbors' pools and pool filter. Our pets are covered in dirt and children can no longer play outside. We have had to water a yard multiple times just to get rid of the dirt that is constantly covering our entire yard. We have complained to the developer several times, at which point they stated they sent out water trucks, but we have never seen one sent we have never once seen those trucks water trucks used. They sit here completely idle. We have also mentioned to the developer that they should replace the fence that goes around the entire property line and put up a privacy fence. This would help alleviate some of the constant daily distractions that this construction is causing us. Our justification for asking for this is that this is a chain link fence that is easily 50 years old. Chain link fences as determined by the manufacturers only have a lifetime of 20 years. The lifetime of the bonds has far surpassed that. Therefore, it is no longer up to code. Please consider doing something about this. We know that this developer is, a literal, is literally eating up every vacant space in the entire city, but they have absolutely no right to demonstrate this level of disrespect and lack of concern for the people who have been here far longer than they have. You have a lot of very irritated people surrounding this development, and if you won't do something, we will need to escalate this further. We rely on you, our city council, to represent the needs and best interests of the residents who have been here for years and years. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to this being a topic in the August 10th meeting. Sincerely, Jessica and Alex Brideau. And I think this was the same comment, but it was submitted again after the, the August 10th meeting, just so you know. Okay. So public comment number two is from Grace Johnson. I hope you could find the time to look this over. 
I hope you, your family, and friends stay safe by taking the proper precautions as we enter into confusing and troubling times as we watch a worldwide pandemic unfold with this coronavirus. Could there be something more deeper going on with all of this? Could we be seeing the signs of the times unfolding? Could this be a door of opportunity for people to open their hearts to what God has to say? Jesus says to his disciples concerning the last days, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24, 7 to 8. We have been seeing a record-setting amount of earthquakes worldwide in various places, including places that normally do not receive earthquakes. Now with this coronavirus, could this be one of the pestilences that will fall upon us in the last days as spoken by Jesus? Where will it leave our economy? Did you know the Bible teaches there will be a cashless society in the last days? Will this be a major stepping stone in bringing that about? You may have seen on NBC News just months ago concerning the implantable RFID microchip that is gaining, around, gaining ground in Sweden where people are getting this microchip implanted in their hand. Would you allow a microchip to be placed inside your body that has the ability to track where you go and what you do? How about if you knew it matched perfectly with Bible prophecy where God warns us not to take it during the future reign of the Antichrist, otherwise we will receive the fullness of his wrath. This may be the most important message you will read in these times. Please do not ignore this. This message reveals what the mark of the beast is and the meaning behind counting a number people have been pondering for centuries, 666. This is truly a message from God. In the revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle John, we read, And he, the false prophet who deceives many by his miracles, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Referring to the last times, this could be only referring to a cashless money society, which we have yet to see, but we are on the horizon of. Why so? Because we would be able to buy or sell without accepting the mark between one another if tangible currency were still around. It logically deduces itself to this end. That is three minutes. Thank you. And we have a voicemail. Sorry, it's taking a little bit longer to load. Mr. Baker, Roger Walter calling you. I live in here near International Academy, which is located on Torby Drive. It's not located on Boyd Street. Not located on Heartland. It's not located on Daly Street. It's located on Torpy Drive. Could you please tell the people of City of Troy that International Academy and Baker Junior High is located on Torpy Drive? The problem we have, Mr. Baker, is people cutting through our neighborhood illegally, which is illegal. We have been cutting through our neighborhood off the Daly Street, off the Heartland Street, to act they have to place a point of entry. There's two places of point of entry to the school. One is off the Rochester Road and Boyd Street, and one is off Rochester Road and Torby Drive. We called the Detroit police so many times, it's sickening. 
I'm going to ask you this one time and one time only because the neighbors here have actually got pretty fictitious of the speeding coming through to the school. I know that Troy please play favoritism to the Troy School District. And Mr. Baker, I know you do too. So, I know you do. I know for a fact that you do. Uh, we're asking the Troy police to step up to the plate and stop the speeding on uh, Floyd Street. Every time we call the Troy police, or our neighbors actually have to step out in the street in order to stop the people from speeding coming off the school to the illegal access that comes off of Boyd Street. Second of all, Mr. Baker, you need to talk to Mr. Nuschewski because it'll all pan out probably into a lawsuit against you and the Toy Police Department for not enforcing the traffic on our street. So then, then that means that we can actually take the city of Troy and the Troy Police Department and you to court for not enforcing the laws in the city of Troy because you, you negligently have rejected that. We're not going to go another year with the speeding and the driving radically and flying down the street like they're an airplane and there are cars that go from zero to 60 and 2.2 houses. That's the problem we have here. Again, Mr. Baker, and Ms. Brooks, and all Troy City Council members, and Ms. Bloom, I've talked to you about this before several times, way before Mr. Baker became uh, mayor of Troy, the 13-year-old. So let me ask you again, Mr. Baker, enforce the traffic on, on Boyd Street, it is illegal to cut to our, uh, to our streets to access a place of point of entry when there is two points of entry. So now we're going to call the Troy Police. Up. That's three minutes. Okay, thank you. That concludes those who submitted public comment prior to 4 p.m. today, uh, either via voicemail to 248-524-3302 or by email public comment at troymi.gov. As a reminder, as long as we're continuing these virtual meetings, those will be the two methods to provide us with your public comment. And uh, now's the opportunity for city administration or city council to respond to anyone. There were three this evening. Um, I actually wanted to start just if, if possible, city manager Miller, um, on two of those calls specifically, uh, Ms. Brido and Mr. Walters. With, as it relates to Ms. Brido, I, I know that email, it seems like that was submitted, I think the city clerk Dixon said it was from prior to, or perhaps just after the last meeting. Um, but I know that the situations continue to escalate a little bit over there with the neighbors. Um, there's been a news piece about a couple of things and I, I, I just, I, I certainly don't want that situation to deteriorate anymore. And I'm not sure what we as a council can do or what city management can do. And I know that you uh, and staff have been working with the um, developer, uh, I think it's Mondrian, um, to, um, to work with the neighbors. Can you give us any kind of update as to what, anything that's changed or anything that we do? Because I just, I don't want these residents to feel like they're not being heard and not being understood because certainly um, we can all relate to having uh, construction come or something and, and a big change in the neighborhood. And if, it, if they feel like they're not getting their needs met by representation from us, then I, I'd like to address that somehow. So is there anything you can give us as relates to that? Yes, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, members of council. Um, I, I'm going to address the development-related issues, and then when I'm completed, I'd like Assistant City Manager Bob Bruner to talk a little bit about the environmental issue that has come up on that site. So this, obviously this came up a few weeks ago and we had um, in our city engineer talk with the developer, um, modern properties, and we also had our engineering field inspector uh, to, to work with the, um, the general contractor hired by modern properties to ensure to keep the dust down and follow what we call our development standards. Um, the city engineer prepares those and they're ultimately approved by city council and there are standards on how to appropriately maintain a construction site. We've been doing that, but I think more concerning more recently has been the, um, what's known as a slime that has literally been bubbling up. And I would like to turn this over to um, assistant city manager Bruner, who has come back from vacation, but has updated himself today and is prepared to have a response. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, very late this afternoon, uh, we got an update on this issue. Um, to bring folks up to speed, um, we had an engineering firm collect um, samples uh, last Thursday, August 20th, and uh, we got the lab re report today. And uh, two compounds were detected. Um, one is called, uh, well, I'll just spell it, T-O-L-U-E-N-E. -E. Um, it's a product uh, produced in the process of making gasoline. It also uses a solvent for paint thinners and adhesives. Um, it's not naturally occurring, but uh, we don't know the history of this property, and there's, there's no way to know where it came from. Uh, the other compound, creosol, is naturally occurring um, in the environment. But in both cases, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, 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 there's no um, amount of creosol in the environment that is regulated by the state or, or w would be considered um, harmful. Uh, in, in the case of um, the other one, it's at the concentration level it was found, it's not significant and does not appear to pose an environmental risk to any of the neighboring homes. Um, however, in order for the development to move forward, the de developer very late this afternoon indicated that the contractor will be removing the material from, from the site. So um, that uh, they plan to um, add some more lime to the material because um, it needs to dry out in order for them to, I mean, we're I guess we're talking about dirt essentially is what we're ta uh, talking about. It may not technically be um, dirt, but it, but it's, um, you know, material on the ground and it needs to be, uh, it, it can't be a liquid in order for them to scoop it up and take it away. So as it'd be dried out to the point where basically they can, um, scoop it up and take it away. So they're going to use lime to do that, and um, they plan to start removing it um, at, by the end of this week and plan to have it all removed within the next two weeks. So um, I know that this is likely to um, create some questions um, among the neighbors, and we'll be working with city staff uh, tomorrow and through the rest of the week to get questions answered and, and update everybody. But overall, I think it's, uh, it's good news. There's um, uh, no immediate uh, risk to health and uh, the developer does intend to actually remove the material from, from the site. So there shouldn't be any long-term effects either. Okay, Bob, I appreciate that. Um, I don't know if the neighbors will appreciate that as much and I, until there's a little bit, I mean, I, I would ask that we make it a priority to get that information to them right away and including copies of the reports if possible so they can do their own research if necessary. I, if they're just hearing about this now at the meeting, if they're tuning in, um, certainly alarm bells are going off in their heads as I would expect them to. So um, if we can do anything, I think if council agrees, I think it's important that they get the, the information as quickly as possible because that's just, that's the most recent issue, but I, I'm hoping, I'm not so sure about the other issues that they've been taking issue with prior to that being addressed either. So if we can at least um, help them under, have some understanding on some of these things. I think that'd be a great start. Um, and um, we'll see where we go from there. Um, Council, uh, regard, is this regarding this particular issue, um, Council Member Chamberlain? Okay, go ahead. I think city manager Miller had some comments as well. So if you would like to go first, I'm happy to comment afterwards. All right, Mark, you can go ahead. I, <laughs> Mayor, I was going to move to a, a next topic. Uh, oh. for employee. Okay. Well, let's go ahead, Rebecca. I'll, I'll carry on. So I do have comments regarding this issue um, that I promised the residents I wanted to share. So I did have the opportunity to go out to Avery Street at the invitation of Jessica Brudeau last week and to be able to see the site from the perspective of those neighbors and really grateful for those who just took some time to talk because um, we hear their pleas and their confusion over what's going on. And I think from my perspective, some of the issues at hand speak to a number of things that I heard, um, heard those residents speak about. And the first is just about the developer doing the right thing, doing the right thing by the people in terms of 
tackling this slime, um, this issue. And now that they have been informed that there is a substance at a higher concentration than is what is um, allowed by EGLE, by the uh, Michigan Department of the Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, by their standards, and that, um, you know, the, of course, it needs, needs to be removed. Um, so they want that to happen. And there's a sense of distrust of having seen it covered up um, before. And so wanting to make sure that that does indeed happen. And the second issue is really around just contractor daily practices um, around dust control, saying that, you know, there are, um, there was the mention, and I, I did see those watering trucks, but not feeling that those were being used during the day. And then I think overall, there's just anxiety about development in general, and especially all of that being compounded by COVID, where people are cooped up in their homes, and we're all working from home, and people want fresh air, and it's hard to get out and be able to get that fresh air in that environment, um, especially when one feels that the contractor working with the developer is not following what they need to be following. And part of my desire on council was to think strategically about sort of resident de driven development, which is why I have paid attention to this issue and kind of how is it, um, how is it playing out. Um, and I think a lot of what I observed is there is a lot of lot going on and there's a lot of confusion for residents between the developer, the contractor and the city. And with these actors, who is doing what, what is each entity's responsibility, who is informing residents, at what stage and for what purpose. And I do think I do thank the city for helping to, to share knowledge with us to help us understand what the city can and cannot do with regards to these development matters and helping us to communicate that well to residents. And for starters, you know, we, we cannot as a as a city and on, on council to we cannot stop a development project at this stage. However, we do have a responsibility to residents to assure that the contractors abide by the regulations regarding things like dust control or the removal of suspect materials like this slime. And I do think it's important for us to think about all of this and how our residents are experiencing development and the different actors involved as we will need to revisit our master plan next year. And I think all of this really um, is um, provides important information to us. So I just wanted to reach out and, and I promised the residents I wanted to speak up about this. and do still want to raise the questions around is there an eagle again that's the the um the michigan department of the environment um for at least an energy energy is there a requirement to remove the material um and how do we know what checks are in place to assure that that happens how can that be um checked just because residents are, are struggling to have trust um, um in both kind of the contractor and developer so just want to be a voice and um and be of help to residents in any way possible Great comments and questions, Rebecca. Thank you for, for giving us that report in the first hand and having the opportunity to go out there and meet with them. I think that that's a, um, a very, very helpful. And um, I, I asked a couple of questions there at the end, which kind of led to some questions that I had at the same time about what is the requirement with Eagle? I mean, and how will we know when it's been done? How will we know if it's been properly done? I don't know, if Mark or Bob, if you're prepared to answer any of those questions tonight, or I know this is all kind of late breaking for you if you needed time to get us the information tomorrow or after if that's okay too, but that is the big question. How will we know when it's been done and how will it be verified that it's been properly done? I think Rebecca, that kind of was the, the end of your, uh, yeah. And I think that would help the neighbors as well. And another reminder to all that, you know, prior to COVID and the other, some of the other issues we've had, that the development has been the driving issue for all of us on city council and in the city and the causing the most pain for our residents and developers alike both of them and we've really struggled with that so I, I want everyone to know out there that we we haven't forgotten about that we are still working with the planning department the planning commission to move forward with updates to the master plan we're doing everything we can recognizing that things took a little bit of a turn over the past several months for obvious reasons but that is still going to once we get out of the the covid um focus um as a nation i think back in troy what's going to come back into play is those development projects and how we can do better with that um for everybody involved so that was a couple of questions and some commentary. I don't know, Mark, if you wanted to, to say anything related to that or Bob, as far as those questions that we had, um, and then Ed and I'll call on you next. All right, Mark. Yeah, yes, just really quick. Um, um, the developer has committed to, to, to move the soils off the site and we will monitor that and report on it. And uh, the, we really can't answer what would Eagle do. And that's one of the things that that assistant city uh, manager, Bob Bruner said, it, we're not exactly sure at this moment 
Um, we do have Ms. Etheridge, who lives near there, who does work for Eagle in the environmental capacity. So we'll coordinate with her and we'll report back to city council. Fantastic. And then, of course, that information we can disseminate to the neighbors who are eagerly waiting for additional information as well, I'm sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Abraham? Thank you, Mayor. I, I do want to comment on, on one other thing Ms. Bordeaux mentioned, and that was the notification of neighbors uh, prior to the development even coming to, to Council. I know that there is a legal requirement where neighbors within X number of feet must be um, must get communication of the development project. And previous council had talked about perhaps um, exceeding what the law requires so that there was a broader disbursement of communication to neighbors. And, um, you know, we, we, there are different seven people sitting at the table today. I wanted to know if, if perhaps this is something that we still wanted to pursue. Uh, previous council certainly did. And I, I get a sense that the seven of us now would want to proceed with that and what next steps might look like. That's an excellent comment. Thanks for bringing that back up. And it, we haven't talked about that in a while, but as we, I, I, I thank you for bringing that up. The whole idea was just because it's the minimum requirements doesn't mean that's all we should do or it's what we have to do, but we can always do more. So I don't know, Mark, where we are, if that's something that gets addressed um, separate and aside from planning commission or, or where, go ahead, Mark, you know where I'm going. Yeah, so I, the way that we'll start out, we'll provide council a report with what the requirements are on this development, because depending how the development is being approved, there are different notification requirements. Right. Um, and off the top of my head, I don't know if this one, the lowest level of notification is when planning commission has the full authority to give site plan approval, where the greatest discretion and there's more notification is when it goes to, uh, there's a public hearing in it or it goes to city council. So what we'll do is we'll outline what happened in this case and then outline what happens with um, the different types of residential developments that could occur in single family areas. Great, thank you. That report will be very helpful. I think we talked a little bit about the joint meeting in February, you can the planning way back then, the idea of, um, you know, maybe I know that some are, some things are required to be published in the newspaper, um, and certainly the, so many feet things get mailed. But when you have bigger lots, sometimes that doesn't touch very many people. But also potentially the use of sh social media, the city social media posting some of these notices out there to reach a broader group. That certainly will invite more commentary. But I think that it, that would go a long way towards letting people know what's going on, so they don't feel like things are happening. Um, behind their backs and especially you know as we hear a lot about the postal service and the mail and the news these days um can't always right now rely on uh, regularity and timing with the postal service um so if that, that report if you could address some of those things possibly as well i think that would be very helpful uh council member Hodor? city manager miller i think you mentioned that there is a resident near there with regard to the environmental aspect and you know wanting all of us to feel assured that we're doing right by that neighborhood, right by the developer too, who's, who has an interest in making sure that that's environmentally safe. Um, I think hearing that there's a, a resident that's outside of maybe these entities that people don't quickly trust um, it, being involved, um, that is really good to hear. And, and you are going to be reaching out to that individual more Yes, we will reach out to her. She, we, we have worked with her on some other sites which were regulated by the DEQ, which is no longer DEQ. Um, our engineering department has worked with her and she lives in the community and near there. And so she did go to the site. I don't know if you remember that. We did report that. And we will touch bases with her to, and try to understand the position that Eagle has. Thank you. Good question, Alan. Um, and before we move on to the other topic, is there anyone else that wanted to speak about this particular public comment? All right, I think I'm gonna kick it back to you, Mark, about uh, Torpy Drive. And certainly um, if you could let any insight if the police department's looked at any trailers or anything, else, whatever they do to help uh, traffic enforcement or what, whatever you have, what are your thoughts on that are? Well, my thoughts are, is there's a long history of 
of traffic issues and our police department at Traffic Uni going generally to the International Academy. Um, what we'll do is we'll refer this over to the police department and they'll, they'll have the traffic unit check into it just like we do whenever we get a, any other complaints. Very good. Appreciate it. I mean, uh, Council, uh, that's always our first line, the first line that we do. So, um, Council Member Harrison Gall? Yeah. Um, is International Academy actually open? Is there anybody, is this a problem at the moment or um, not to in any way diminish the fact that it's been a problem in the past, but I was just curious if that was an immediate problem or something that perhaps he's commenting on a past history. It's a good question. City Manager Miller? I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I honestly don't know if it's a new problem. Obviously, school has not been for the past few months, you know, even going back into normal school time, school hasn't been in session. I don't know. I do know someone who has a child going to another international academy, but they're doing virtual education. I just don't know what's going on at this location. Okay. Could be that Mr. Walters is anticipating a problem when school does come back based on previous conduct, but we'll look into it for sure. Appreciate the commentary. And, um, anyone else can have any uh, response to public comment this evening? All right, we will move on to uh, there's no post post uh, no postponed items this evening, so we head on to regular business. Um, I have no mayoral appointments, but we do have city council appointments. I'll turn it over to Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton for that. Thank you, Mayor. I resolve that Troy City Council hereby appoints Mahendra Kenkri to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the alternate position that expires on January 31st, 2021. Support. Support. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Supported by Council Member Hoderick that we City Council appoints uh, Mahendra Kenkri as the alternate to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the term that expires January 31st, 2021. Any discussion this evening? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Motion carries, and a special thank you to Mr. Kankri for being part of this important board, even as an alternate. It comes in, the alternate has, alternate comes into play quite a bit, it seems like, these days, so we appreciate that. Uh, that concludes the City Council appointments this evening. We next move on to I-2. Um, I have no mayoral nominations this evening. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, are there any city council nominations? None this evening. All right. So next up on the agenda is I-3, a request for closed session. And I'll go ahead and move, be it resolved, that Troy City Council shall meet in closed session as permitted by MCL 15.268E, Darling versus Troy et al., and Adam Community Center versus Troy slash USA versus Troy. Support. All right. Moved by the chair, supported by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, that we approve I-3, the request for closed session, is right into the record. Any discussion? Okay, the vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Motion carries. Next on the agenda is I-4, oh. COVID hazard pay for city employees. This will be introduced by Jeanette Menig, our human resources director and city manager, Mark Miller. Ms. Jeanette, coming on, where is she? There she is. Well, Mayor, Mayor, this is uh, Mark Miller. Just really quick, um, uh, sort of a housekeeping item. When we complete, I'm going kind of back to the um, scheduling of the closed session. Okay. When, when this meeting ends, I will prepare a Zoom meeting and send it to everyone who is invited to the closed session, confidential closed session, including um, our, our labor attorney. Very good. Thanks for that reminder. And um, just, yeah, closed session, it'll be, it'll be closed. So very good. 
Appreciate that. Okay, so Mayor, I'll start off on and turn over to Human Resources Director um, Jeanette Menig. Um, so the, the state of Michigan has offered an opportunity for reimbursement of first responders and Jeanette Menig will sort of describe what those are and that's up to a thousand dollars. On my recommendation and concurrence with Public Works Director Kurt Bovard, Chief and all of our senior staff, um, we, we thought that it would be best to um, also reimburse our public works employees that work through the core of the pandemic at least 50% of the time. And many of those public work employees work 100% of the time. And that would um, have to come from the uh, general fund for that type of re reimbursement for those public works employees. And I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Menick. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Mark. And uh, hello, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, it was back in July that we learned of the opportunity to provide hazard pay to our first responders with no direct city expense. Um, it would be completely reimbursed through the state of Michigan through the CARES Act. And when we reviewed the application and found that there were very strict definitions of the employee categories that could re be reimbursed through this program, um, we, it caused some pause um, because as you know, we, um, the city, benefited from in-person work that was done not just by first responders, but by um, several different uh, classes of employees. And uh, that in-person work took place during the stay home, stay safe order. The vast majority of these employees, as um, City Manager Miller indicated, were in the public works department. Um, working on maintaining the infrastructure throughout the uh, stay home order. But there were a few others that I'd just like to highlight because I think it gives a good picture of, you know, who, who are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about engineering field employees who were some of the very first to return to regular in-person work. We're uh, talking about building operations or facilities employees who work to prepare the workspaces for the rest of us to return, um, installing, um, Sure, you remember that um, a memo with the pictures in it installing the plexiglass and the uh, six foot um, demarcations in the buildings. Um, also, our fleet maintenance employees who work to support uh, the vehicles that the police and fire and, and other employees were, um, were using throughout this time period and on. And um, also, our parks employees who service the very high demand parks uh, throughout this period. And the one that really touches my heartstrings is the Troy Ride employees who continue to provide medical transportation and had very close contact with individuals throughout this time period. Um, because on the Troy Ride, it would not be unusual for an employee to need to latch in a wheelchair. And you, you can't do that without getting uh, within six feet of the individual. So it's our interest to pursue um, a hazard pay program for these employees in addition to our first responders. And um, because the first responder program is going to reimburse us, um, it's our assumption based on our application, um, we may bear the cost, the full cost for this program, but uh, we really do feel that it's important to recognize these employees. Very, very good. Um, appreciate that. Um, I, I have a question based on what you just said, and I, I'm going to make sure I understand correctly. Do we have any indication as to the likelihood of the reimbursement request for this? Uh, I, I just to, to, I, let me say it right now. I I almost don't care because I think that these workers have been working so hard since day one, and they they don't get the attention that our healthcare workers and our police and fire get. But I know, and I, I know Kurt Bowman sleeps on the line. I, I hope you can communicate, Kurt, to your staff and the department at large how much we uh, appreciate all of what the employees have done prior to even talking about this hazard pay. But I mean, we know how hard you've been working. We see you out there in our streets and our drains and doing everything so that, and servicing our vehicles. So that, thank you for that to start. But to the question, Jeanette, um, what the likelihood of actually the reimbursement request? So I'm, there's two, uh, two sides to that answer. So the um, first responder hazard pay premium program, I think I just put two of those P's in the wrong order, but it's the FRHPPP, which is what we submitted for the first responders. We requested um, an advance payment 
payment uh, because we haven't made the payment to the employees yet through that program, which is uh, just shy of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, representing a thousand dollars for each first responder that would qualify. That is anticipated to be reimbursed because all of our uh, first responders qualify under the plan. It would be the remaining approximately 120 employees that we've identified that at this time there is not a um, reimbursement program yet, although um, uh, Rob Malzak has um, spoken to me several times about it. We've uh, discussed that there may be opportunities, and I'll, I'll punt the second part of the question over to him because I see he just signed on. Hi, thanks, Good Hi, Rob. Welcome back, or welcome. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so to uh, c talking from what Jeanette just said, we are looking into reimbursement for that from the county for the uh, employees that are covered by the public safety portion. So there's a good chance that this could get reimbursed. But what we put forward to you today is, is if it wasn't going to, at worst case, it would be at most $120,000 hit to the budget. I see. I see. Very, very good. You know, I, I asked because obviously, you know, reimbursements are great for the city, but I, I'm a firm believer that if, if there's an opportunity out there that the city needs to take full advantage of it. So if it's our tax dollars that are going initially or, you know, however the money, the debt is being run up, but that money, it should come back to us we, if it can. So I know you guys are all working very hard on finding opportunities like that. You've been, we've seen reports on how much work you're doing towards that, but I appreciate that. Um, did any, uh, City Manager Miller? Really quick, just um, a general statement. We we are preparing a report for the next council agenda, sort of outlining all of the different programs we have sought reimbursement and what we're going to seek reimbursement because there's a wide variety of deadlines and, and um, types of programs. A lot of it, though, is CARES Act dollars, but we, we're going to provide that at the next meeting to help um, inform council and the public of our efforts to get as much reimbursement from the CARES Act as possible. Thank you. And to, to Jeanette's point about what whether we would get reimbursed for the uh, public safety, my understanding from the state is that was a $100 million program. It's first come, first serve. Um, but what I'm, what I'm hearing from the state is that there's plenty of money in that bucket. So that is, I don't want to ever tell you guys it's guaranteed until it's in the bank, but it's, very likely that that would happen. Very good, thank you, Rob. Um, other questions on I-4 for city management? I'll move the resolution. I'd like to move I-4, resolved that the Troy City Council hereby approves the COVID hazard pay program for the city of Troy employees, pending the approval of our first responder hazard pay program application from the state of Michigan for the maximum possible unreimbursed cost of $120,000 in fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Support. Support. Oh, so hard. <laughs> Moved by the chair, supported by Council Member Abraham, that we approve I-4 as read into the record. Any discussion? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank all the first responders and all the DPW workers and everyone else that has kept our city safe the last few months and we've been fortunate us on council that we've been able to work remotely and my day job at ford i'm able to work remotely but there's some people that can't and the sacrifice and humility of them the last six months has uh, has really been inspiring and i just thank you from the bottom of my heart for all they've done i'm glad we can support them a little bit with this program that's exactly right. I mean, I think that you're, we've all, we're all, we're virtual right now, but I know that those employees, they, that first day everyone else got shut down, they had to go into their work and do the projects that they were working on and they've been there every single day and they come in contact with, think of it, tons and tons of people. So, I mean, that's absolutely, we can't thank you enough, um, all of you who have worked so hard for the city and our residents to keep us safe, to keep us healthy and the things you're doing. So. Um, other to com uh, discussion or comments? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? 
Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Jeanette and Rob, for popping on for this one. Appreciate it. Appreciate the good questions and answers. Uh, next on the agenda is I-5, a budget amendment and construction contract amendment, Firefighters Memorial Project. to be introduced by Fire Chief Dave Roberts, Kirk Bovensee, Public Works Director, where we can now thank in the flesh, and uh, City Manager Mark Miller. Mayor, I'll start off. Um, I good. just um, just say that um, um, Dave Roberts will give a, a good summary, but what I'd like to identify is that um, the Troy Firefighters Community Fund had contributed just about, just under $60,000 for this project. And um, when um, Kurt Bowens even Public Works um, said that they could work on the foundation and footings. They just didn't realize the, that there was actually specific tolerances that that footings would have to adhere to. And obviously, Kurt can talk about that in greater detail than I can. And um, so, therefore, that unfortunately, um, we were not unable to utilize them. We had to bid it out. And so, um, we've gotten to a point where we have to do, request a budget amendment to move the project along. But given this is um, for the volunteer firefighters in Firefighters Park, I think it's it's a good thing to support the volunteer firefighters and provide a permanent um, memorial for them. And um, Chief Roberts can give a little summary. Thanks, Mark. Welcome, Chief. I know you're not showing us your face, but we're going to hear your voice. Well, believe me, that's good for all of you. Uh, good <laughs> evening, Mayor and uh, City Council members. Uh, actually, Mark did a good job of summarizing it, but I just like to maybe tie that all together to say that this certainly wasn't anything that we planned um, with the budget amendment. We, we thought we had enough funds with the fundraising that everyone did, and not to make excuses with COVID, but uh, I will. Uh, COVID delayed the project, um, which uh, didn't get started, obviously, as soon as we wanted to. Um, DPW, no fault of their own, realized, uh, uh, fortunately, early on that they couldn't uh, accept the uh, engineering tolerances for the project. We certainly don't want a weak foundation for the memorial. And so that forced us to kind of reevaluate our options. Uh, we obtained some quotes. And of course, then you have the memo in front of you of uh, who we're recommending for the project. And um, with all of that said and done, we're still faced with some uncertainties based on when contractors can start work. So it looks like in reality that uh, once this is approved, if you decide to approve it tonight, uh, then we'll work on a timeline, but we're probably looking at the spring or summer of 2021 for starting completion for the project. Very, very good. Uh, Kurt, did you have anything to add at this time or as part of the presentation or are you just here for questions? No, I, I can add. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, as you all know, uh, DPW uh, helps out wherever we can and it's unfortunate that this time we can't, but uh, these one eighth of an inch tolerance is uh, to give you an idea, a house is built within one to two inches of tolerance. So uh, we felt that risking delaying this project with the foundations being out of tolerance, that uh, the right thing to do is to, to uh, pass this on to another contractor that's more uh, familiar with building these types of foundations. Very good. Well, it's important to do it right. And you do save us a lot of money in many other places. And um and now I can thank you while looking at your face. And please let everybody at the DPW know how much we appreciate um, all the work you've done since mid-March going through all of the COVID times and being out there for us. But I'm beating a dead horse at this point, but it's never you can never beat a dead horse to thank somebody for all the good work they're doing. So please do share that with them. And uh, Chief Roberts, I know you mentioned, and City Manager Miller, the almost $60,000 that the firefighters and had raised. I mean, that's they worked very, very hard to get that much money. And I, there's some firefighters out there, I think, who hounded me on several occasions to buy tickets to things. And they worked really hard to, to get that much money for this project. And I don't want that to go unsaid either. I mean, I, really, it's a, it's tough to raise money for anything these days. But I think to see that amount of dollars going to this great cause shows how much our community cares and values our volunteer firefighters and how much we're looking forward to seeing this beautiful memorial at Firefighters Park. Um, that said, any questions for city management or Chief Roberts on I-5? No questions, but anybody like to move I-5? Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. I'll move I-5, bud budget amendment and construction contract amendment, firefighters memorial project as printed in the agenda packet. 
Support. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, supported by Council Member Chamberlain Kranga, that we approve I-5 budget amendment and construction contract amendment, firefighters memorial project as printed in the agenda. Any discussion? Uh, Council Member Hodrick. I just, I wanted to comment again, because um, I think this is worth um, repeating. Uh, the DBW is so appreciated by the firefighters. I've had on several occasions, firefighters comment about their appreciation for the great work they do, making sure the fire hydrants are good to go, um, that that water pressure is there unsolicited and enthusiastically. So um, it's just another example of um, where, you know, behind the scenes, there's a lot of locking of arms that goes on among the members of city staff and the various departments. They don't function in the silos that sometimes we think about. And in many ways, the DPW are like the first, the first responders for the first responders. You know, they're, they're there to make sure that they can do their job and um, are so critical. So uh, hats off to um, the team for acknowledging what it can do really well and with excellence and also saying, hey, we wanna make sure we protect the integrity of this. And um, I feel very comfortable supporting this and, and um, you know, often government gets it, uh, criticized for not properly looking forward and anticipating um, issues that they could have seen. And one of the things I value about this city team is that I do think to the best of your ability and with as much foresight sight as possible, this is a team that tries to look forward and you know, um, really appreciate that we're gonna do this and do it right um, because that memorial deserves it. Firefighters Park is one of our most beautiful areas in the city and this memorial will just be a wonderful asset there. And um, I feel good about making sure that we're getting it right. Thanks, thanks to everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely, perfect, perfect comments, Ellen. Uh, any other discussion? Ellen said it all, I guess. <laughs> all right, uh, the vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Chief Roberts and Kurt, for being on for that. Uh, next is the consent agenda. Um, I believe there was a late submittal update to the consent agenda. Now I can't remember which one it's for. So. Um, anybody like to pull anything from the, I'm sure Mark, hold on one second. I, I know it's related to the pistols, I'm just looking for the number. Um, any, uh, anyone need to pull anything from the consent agenda? No. All right, and then I'd like to move the items. Mayor, it's item B, the pistols are item B. Thank you. Yeah, there they are. All right, so there was a late submittal for J4B um, that's part of the agenda online. Um, Anyone would like to, Council Member Abraham. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move all items on the consent agenda as printed um, with J4B as amended on what would be the yellow sheet. Support. Moved by Council Member Abraham, supported by Mayor President Hamilton, that we approve all items on the consent agenda, including the late to middle amendment of J4B. Any discussion? The vote, Ms. Oh, Mayor President Hamilton? Yeah, I just want to briefly mention uh, J7 is the City of Troy 2020 Transportation Asset Management Plan. And I found this to be a very informative uh, bit of information about the roads that are under Troy's jurisdiction. We're, we control over 337 mi center line miles of roads in our city between local and major roads. And this kind of summarizes how we strategize over the next three years to uh, repair and replace and maintain these roads and where our funding levels are and what the funding levels needed to really drastically improve the condition of the roads would be. So 
uh, I, I would just, this is really just a plan that we pass up the chain of county and, and state government to show what we're going to do. But it, I think it's a great resource just to understand kind of the jurisdictional issues and the financial, what we put into each year, uh, our roads. I see Mark has a comment there. Very good. Um, City Manager Miller, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. I just would like to comment that these, this asset management plan is actually a very new requirement from MDOT, and um, our engineering department was one of the first um, departments to work on it, and we believe it's a, a really good planning tool um, kind of related to our capital planning. That's great. I, I, you know, while, while we're talking about it, the, Troy has a, a pretty good history over the past several years of paying extra attention to its roads. We have the Troy Roads Rock program and Troy Roads Rock 2. And I know city engineer Bill Hootery is quick to answer any questions we ever have about any of the roads. And um, the staff is always out making sure we're well taken care of. And this planning tool is great. So it, great point to bring up Mayor Bridget Hamilton. I'm glad you called that one out. We, we often pass the consent agenda without talking a lot about these things publicly. But there's good stuff in there, too. Councilmember Chamberlain Crangan, did you have something? Yes, so following uh, Mayor Pertem Hamilton, I also wanted to comment on this um, this great resource. As I've been speaking with residents a lot over the past couple of months, local roads is something of great concern to residents. And so I was in my own mind thinking, how could I communicate? It's a very dense, um, rich document of how, how might I uh, communicate that as a council member out to residents to let them know that we have a rich process around decision making in terms of which roads are um, the process by which you determine roads that need to be redone and, and whatnot. So something that's on my mind and how to share that out. Um, and in my own neighborhood, we have some local roads that are gonna be um, um, currently um, being, uh, being upgraded as well. So it's a great resource to be able to um, provide to folks and find a way to talk about that. Great comments, very true. Okay, uh, the vote Ms. Dixon on the consent agenda. Councilmember Erickson Gall? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Motion carries. All items on the consent agenda have been approved this evening. Uh, next up is memorandums and future council agenda items. There are none this evening. Uh, we have handled public comment and reply. There are no council referrals this evening, so we'll head into council comments. Does anybody have any comments from council not related to the reports? Sorry, I'm checking. Not seeing any hands. Oh, Mayor President Hamilton. I just wanted to give um, my personal condolences to um, one of our neighboring communities, Royal Oak, uh, Kim Gibbs, a Royal Oak uh, counselor passed away uh, in the last week. And I just wanted to give my thoughts and condolences to their family and all their, her supporters. And, and all, all of us here are elected officials and, and we know the dedication that involves that. So whenever tragedy like this happens, I, they're in my thoughts and prayers. That's uh, very well said, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I knew Kim Gibbs a little bit, um, and I, the one thing that I, I, when I first met her, she, I was at an event for something, and she had the most infectious big laugh that filled the room. So, I mean, I, I'll always remember her laughter and her, um, the, her smile and the, and the good time she had. And, and I know things have been tough for her a little bit, but uh, we definitely care about her family and her supporters and her fellow council members. I can't imagine what that would be like. Um, knowing all of you. So um, our prayers for her family, for sure. Uh, Council Member Chamberlain Kanga, did you have something as well? I thought I saw your hand go up. Um, yes, I wanted to just kind of briefly go back to the Mondrian properties. It's also following Council Member Abraham's comments about rethinking, reevaluating maybe um, when uh, notice and kind of, or the, um, the breadth of that notice being able to go to um, residents in the area of a development in advance of Planning Commission meeting. So fully supportive of that um, and would love at some point some kind of conversation around um, the different touch points because I think as, as I spoke with the Avery Street residents, they did say that some touch points did happen. They did recall that 
when there was a planning commission hearing, they did receive something, but that was quite some time ago. And then they did at one point have an invitation from the developer to have a conversation about the property. But again, that was over a year before they actually started developing the property. And then there was the thought that maybe, maybe when they didn't see over the course of a year, nothing happening, they started to assume maybe nothing was going forward on that property. And so it was more of an issue, I think, as I talked to residents around when that communication is happening, who owes them that communication? Because sometimes there's confusion when it's coming from the city and for what purpose? That's the purpose of a public hearing. And then from a developer, um, that's not at a point where they can stop a development, but that is um, for the developer to, you know, to have some community engagement. And so residents to understand at what point can they intervene to, um, to give feedback that can actually kind of change a project in some way and what that change means in a public hearing versus when they meet with a developer, those mean different things. So I'm just really interested in those different dynamics and what might be the, the full suite of different communication tools that we can use. And even um, after when there's a public hearing um, beyond those notifications that will be going to residents, maybe there's signs and maybe we do do that, that go up on our property as well in case people miss uh, miss um, postcards or letters that, that come in the mail, but um, would love to think of the um, the suite of things that might happen, whether that's part of a master plan update or something, anything that we can do sooner than later, I know that would be appreciated. And again, support council member Abraham's um, suggestion that she pointed out. Thank you, Rebecca. I assume city manager Miller, that'll be part of the report or some of that will be covered in the report you plan to prepare for us. Um, I just, I had a memory, I thought of something. Seems to me that I, there was a project a couple years ago on council that came back before us for a little bit of an alteration, but they had, it had been about 10 years since they had their initial approval to actually develop the property. So that can go to show how long these things can sit inactive, which you, you get new residents that come in that don't realize. And, and that, that's, you know, that's part of that. I understand, you know, we can't be responsible for getting information out all the time on a real time basis because people have property rights and they're, they're, they have the right to develop them once they've gotten their approvals. But it does seem that maybe we could um, at least work on some streamlined techniques or at least some educational tools that give people an updated idea. Obviously, we have our planning portal, which you can get really great information about proposed projects throughout the city and where you know certain projects are. <clears throat> but again, sometimes there can be a lag and you know, you've know you got something that got approved a year or two ago, but nothing, no shovels are in the ground yet people do tend to forget about those things or um, just not expect it. And then when it starts, they think, well, what happened, right? So I'm, now I'm repeating you a little bit, Rebecca, but um, look forward to seeing some of that information, Mark, and how we can, what we can do as a council, what we can't do. I'm sure there's some things as well. And so we can work to get a better product for both the residents and the developers throughout our community. Um, additional council comments, I saw council member Erickson Gold's hand go up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hope I'm coming through. I seem to be having some internet problems. Everybody keeps freezing on me. Um, so first of all, I wanted to uh, thank you, Mayor, for mentioning the planning portal that actually came up within the past week. Uh, someone in my neighborhood was asking, what's happening at the northwest corner of Square Lake and DeQuinder? And because we had that planning portal, I was able to easily get them the information to show them that there's a medical office going up there. So it's a great tool and uh, I promote that a lot. The other, the, I just wanted to briefly comment, uh, kind of backtracking a little bit to the consent agenda uh, item J8. Uh, I just want to, first of all, thank our wonderful clerk, Aileen Dixon and her amazing staff and all the work they did in the primary and all the work they're continuing to do. No rest for the wicked. <laughs> Uh, to get ready for the November election. And um, I want to draw people's attention to all the new wonderful dates that we've just now approved uh, to first either pick up your ballot so you don't have to rely on the mail to deliver your ballot, uh, drive through clerk's office in case you're having trouble, uh, if you haven't received your ballot or uh, you need to make some other, you have some other issues. And then finally, uh, the new drop-off boxes that will allow uh, everybody to safely drop off their ballot and not have to worry about whether it's going to get lost in the mail. So, and I encourage everybody who is not to register to vote. Uh, and if you're already registered, 
please consider voting by AV ballot. Um, I think that our clerk's office has done everything possible to make this as easy and streamlined. And uh, also for those of you who want to vote in person, um, I, you know, my props to our clerk's office for making sure that it continues to be a very safe and uh, well-run process. So just wanted to point that out and thank you. Very good. You know, Aileen, the election's gonna be over in November and then we're not gonna talk about you for a while. So let's <laughs> soak it all in now because we do appreciate all the hard work you and your team are doing. And it seems like we just had an election. No, wait, we did. And now here we go again. So, uh, but yeah, good, good comments. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, additional council comments this evening? Or city attorney comments? Yeah. Uh, Mayor, you, you brought up the uh, most recent election, and this uh, gives us an opportunity to review our rules of procedure. And so um, this is something that uh, we would like to bring back at the next meeting. And so if any of the council members have any specific modifications or requests for revisions to our rules of procedure, to city council's rules of procedure, um, we are happy to take those. You can contact myself or Mark or Aileen, and we're happy to uh, bring those back at the next meeting. Appreciate that. Do you have any, um, uh, I know you plan to make a few changes, administrative changes that need to be done, for example, because Council Member Chamberlain Crank is duly elected now. Um, are you planning on sending a red line copy around to us prior, or just I, as a reminder, I guess to all of my fellow council members, those rules, take a look at them and <laughs> make any comments prior to that, but I, I don't know what your plan is, City Attorney Bloom, but um, I know I have a couple thoughts as we've talked about that I'd like to put forward, so I will be doing that. Yeah, we're, we're happy to gather the information from the council members. I'm happy to give you the link uh, for the rules so that you can, so that all council members can access it quickly. I can send that out tomorrow. I think that would be great. Thank you. And the other council comments this evening? Oh, yeah. Council Member Hoder. Welcome, Rebecca. Congratulations. It's official. Yeah, the, those Oakland County ballots were certified, as I understand. So it, that's why you were able to be sworn in this evening. So very good. All right. Uh, next on the agenda are reports. Did anybody have any comments about the reports this evening? Uh, I will start just then. Um, the library millage community engagement plan update, appreciate that continued information and the value or the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the, con the, the consistent effort to make sure there's something for us to read each week <laughs> about the, how we're gonna do this because that's gonna end up being a better product for our community. And um, I know we are almost ready to pull the trigger on sending out some neutral, fact neutral um, information pieces um, as a, put out the plan. I don't know, uh, Assistant City Manager Bruner, if you wanted to add anything to that since you popped on the screen. Uh, but appreciate the work you've been doing on that. And I know you've been on vacation, so welcome back. It's good to be back. And um, the, the postcard, uh, we're working on finalizing that this week. So it probably won't be distributed this week as uh, we'd initially um, put in the report um, that you're referring to, but we're still uh, in good shape overall. Uh, I would also mention, uh, Kathy and I uh, have done our made our first stop on what we call the Library Roadshow. We uh, spoke to um, Troy Invisible um, last Wednesday night. Um, uh, although I was on vacation, I did uh, log in and uh, we talked to that group and answered questions. And so I want to take this opportunity to say uh, if there's any groups in the community that um, would like uh, for me and Kathy to uh, join a virtual meeting and talk about the library millage, we're, we're happy to do that. And uh, you can find Kathy's email address online and, and let her know and, and uh, we'll make arrangements to participate. Thank you for that. I didn't see you pop on, Kathy. Nice to see you as well. So, I uh, Speaking of that, could you talk a little bit about the two um, virtual town halls that you plan to do and what the procedure will be for those if you know at this point, just so those who are watching tonight or certainly we can talk about, we can answer questions about them if they come up. I'm not sure, would that be something you'll need to pre-register for or, or what will the process be? 
Uh, short answer is we're still working on that. Um, we have uh, target dates on, um, let me see, September 23rd and October 1st. Um, but we, we need to coordinate and make sure that um, we have the appropriate staff in place to be able to um, record them and cable cast them. So um, we're, we're still working out some details uh, internally, and then we'll announce um, how people will, will register and participate. Okay. Um, Kathy? Thank you, Mayor. Um, the library has a registration system that we use for our programs, so um, we would go that way and just ask people to register through the library's website, and then they would be sent a link to participate. And I think I asked this before, but now I can't remember. I, I'd like to be there to watch in live real time. There might be other council members as well that would like to do that. And then we run into potentially having, even if we're not making decisions, but we're all logged in. City Attorney Bloom, I see you ready to unmute. But is that something we need to potentially schedule as special meetings to handle something like that? Or can you advise us on that? Uh, yes, if it's a social occasion or if it's just viewing, then you, it's not, uh, you're not deliberating. So the Open Meetings Act would not require notice. However, being conservative, um, if, if you're going to, if it's, if you have enough notice um, and you know that there will be a quorum of council members and there might be discussion erring on the side of being very conservative, you may want to post that as a, as a meeting. I think that's something we should possibly consider just to have it ready, um, just to be on the safe side. Because um, I know this council pretty well, and I think that many of us will want to be at least at one of them, if not both of them. So, um, and I'm laughing about uh, Bob and Kathy going out or meeting with some of the groups in the Troy. Talk about the need for hazard pay. That could be dangerous, guys. But I, <laughs> I, good luck if you do that. That's that's a good good tool to do. And anybody who has a group of people that are any of the social or civic groups in the, in the city. Uh, I know Bob and Kathy would absolutely love to come and speak to you and answer your questions and give a presentation and get your feedback to work through that. And I think that's an important part of the process as well. And as more and more people are involved in using Zoom and these online platforms, maybe like we saw with the focus groups, a great opportunity to get more direct um, engagement. So thank you for willing to do, uh, for offering to do that, both of you. Uh, any other comments? on the, the reports this evening. All right, well, we do have a closed session this evening, so I will not be adjourning this meeting now. I'm going to recess into closed session. We'll be adjourning from closed session at the appropriate time as a reminder to council. Uh, Mark, is, or is the link coming from you? I saw you, I can read lips. You said yes. But, no, uh, the, you, everybody you have to check your email to get the link from Mark for this next meeting. It'll be a closed session. Also, uh, be prepared to go into the confidential portal if you need to see any of the attorney-client privilege documents. Um, and with that, we will recess. And, uh, well, like I said, I'll adjourn for closed session. Thanks, everybody. Good night.